here. Pull it up here for you. Okay, well, I want to welcome everyone to today's service of Christ Reformed Church. I'm Pastor Ferguson. It's good to see y'all again. Amen. God is still on the throne. He hasn't gone anywhere. Amen. He's still in control. Control of the weather, the birds, the animals, all of his creation. He's in control, isn't he? Amen. Yes, we can trust in our God. He is a sovereign God. Amen. And that's good to know that God's in control of everything, isn't it? Amen. So when you go to the Lord in prayer as we're about to do it uh, draws you closer to the Lord it, uh, what it does is it's communion with God mm -hmm. amen communion with God John can you flick that light switch that yes thank you just a little bright on my my old eyes <laughs> y'all can still see me can't you all right. So uh, we're going to go to God in a word of prayer, as always, before we get into the uh, sermon today, which will be on Psalm 25. And uh, I've got some really good stuff for you. So let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Let us pray. With every head bowed and eyes closed, let us focus in on the eternal God who is to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come unto you through the blood and the person, the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for giving us this day our daily bread. We praise you and love you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is to you that we turn our attention this hour. We pray that you will cleanse us from all iniquity, that you will create in each one of us clean hearts and renew right minds within us, that you will cause us to dwell close to thee, that we will be drawn closer unto thee each and every day of our lives here on earth. Father, we can do nothing without you, but with you we can do all things. We thank you for never leaving us, nor forsaking us, but for always being with us and comforting us with your loving and tender hand. Lord Jesus, we thank you for taking all of our sins upon thine own holy body. We thank you for dying that horrible and cruel death that you had to go through. Yes, Lord. We thank you for sending the Holy Spirit and to our hearts. We praise you, Holy Spirit, for your sanctifying and regenerating work that you have done in our lives. We bow down before your sovereignty, Father, and we are asking for your blessing and your favor. We, Father, are turning to you. You are our help. You are our deliverer, our strong tower, our fortress from the enemy. Oh God, we can do nothing without you, but with you, Lord, do all things. Oh, yeah. Your word says that contentment with godliness brings about great gain. So we pray you would teach us how to be content with the things that you give us and to focus in on being like you, Lord. We thank you for your holy word. It is a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. We pray that you'll continue to bless our reading, understanding, application, and memorization of thy most holy and righteous word. 
Father, that we will do the work that you have called us to do. That we will not become distracted by seeking our own selfish agenda, but that we will stay focused on the gospel, on sharing the gospel with thy children, wherever they may be. Father, we pray that you will keep us from temptation, that you will deliver us from the evil one who is the devil, that you will keep us from our own fleshly and sinful inclinations. Father, that you will cause us to become more like Christ. For we pray and ask these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, you talk about the devil and all that. First I heard on the radio this afternoon when I go to do it. And uh, you'd be surprised how many <laughs> oh, way the prophets are it's, uh, not even um uh, how do I want to say it? They're not even religion, but they try to they get money from people and all that. And yes, uh, they're not even prophets. Well, the Bible says that many false prophets will come in my name. Yeah. So it's our duty as Christians to identify the false preachers from the true ones. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And how you do that is by putting up the Word of God against their Word. And you say, are they in accordance, in alignment with the Word of God? And 95% of the guys and women on TV are not. Yeah. So there's only a few that actually are in alignment with the Word of God. Amen. Yeah. Only a few. Huh? I myself yeah. do not even watch television yeah. uh, just for the mere basis so I can spend my time yeah. uh, doing better things and reading good books rather than watching uh, all that silly stuff on that yeah. book too, right? <laughs> that what they call it, the idiot box. <laughs> TV will yeah. not make you smarter, it make yeah. you dumber, won't it? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. if you want well, to be on TV. If you want to be smart, yeah. you just open up the book, right? Yeah. Start reading or listening to the Bible. Uh, and that will make you smart. Make you wise and knowledgeable. Let's let this bell pass, and then I'll get started. I know it's hard for you to hear me over that. Well, let me just go ahead and start reading the scripture. Of Psalm 25. This is a psalm of guidance and protection. It begins by these words here. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy ways, O Lord, teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness' sake. 
O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he will teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. Amen. Amen. And he will show them his covenant. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn thee unto me, and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Oh, bring thou me out of my distresses. Look upon mine affliction and my pain, and forgive all my sins. Amen? Amen. Consider mine enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. Oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Amen. So I have read to you Psalm 25. Now let me begin in verse 1. I'm going to be doing an exposition, basically a commentary, which I've already written several pages on this psalm, and I figured it's time to preach it out. Amen. My little book here has been sitting on the table. The sermon has been prepared several months ago, and I figure I better get to preaching it. Amen. <laughs> ain't going to do no good. The spiders ain't going to learn much from my sermon sitting on the dusty table, is it? No. I say this sermon needs to be fed to God's sheep. That's my job as a pastor, is to feed you the unadulterated Word of God. Amen? It's not to add any of my own opinions or agenda uh, to it, but it is to let the Word of God speak in its simplicity, thereby letting you understand the Word of God in its simplicity. The Word of God does not need my help. Amen? God need, does not need our help. God, when He wrote His book, He made it plain and simple, didn't He? The book is black and white. That means there's no gray involved. Amen? So let me begin in verse 1. In you I trust. The word here for trust is batak. This, of course, is a Hebrew word. And it means to go quickly or hasten uh, for help and for refuge. And figuratively, to trust, to be confident or sure, to be bold and secure, careless. Now, careless. Now, you think of the word careless, you think, careless is being uh, irresponsible. But that's not what the word means here. Careless means to be without care, without worry, without fear. When you run to the Lord, as it says in the book, in you do I trust, then you can rest in the Lord. Now, when you go to bed at night, I don't imagine that you uh, look under the bed and you make sure the legs are not going to fall off and, and you measure everything and say, okay, now, uh, I think this bed will hold me up. Uh, I've made my measurements. I've looked under there and made sure 
the legs are not falling off. You don't do that, do you? You go to your bed, you know the bed is able to hold you up. Unless, of course, the bed is a hundred years old and, and you've had trouble with it the last few nights. And then you know you can't trust it. You may fall to the ground in the middle of the night. But you take your shoes off and you simply get into your bed and you lay down. You're trusting in the bed, aren't you? You're trusting the bed can support your body. When we come to God, we come trusting in Him, trusting in His Word. He wants us to take Him at His Word. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that no temptation has taken you, but that which is common unto man. Amen. And God will provide a way of escape. He will not give you more than you can bear. Say, well, why don't I bear through it? Why do I always cave? Why does it seem like I cave in uh, to anger or to passion or lust or greed or coveting? Why is it that I have such a hard time resisting? Well, the answer is found in God's Word. The answer is, you have not drawn nigh unto the Lord. They that are in the flesh will do the deeds of the flesh. Amen? But they that walk in the Spirit shall not do the deeds of the flesh, but they shall do the deeds of the Spirit. For the flesh and the Spirit are at war one with another, so that you can't do the things that you would. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 7, why am I still doing the things that I hate? Well, because of the flesh, isn't it? The flesh is not going to allow you always to do the things you would. Namely, to always be in the service of the Lord. But we have one who is greater than our own selves. The Bible says, he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Who is in the world? Well, that is an antonym simply meaning the flesh. God who lives in you is he who is greater than he that is in the world. God is greater than you is what I'm trying to get across. Amen. So when God says you have the power to resist sin, you do not have the power inherently in your own self. The power resides in the Lord, doesn't it? And because of the fact that the Lord lives in you, you are conjoined to that power, aren't you? You're plugged in to the socket in the wall, so to speak. The Lord being the socket, you being the device that needs to be plugged in in order to get powered up. You've got to have power to overcome the enemy, don't you? What army is there that goes to, to war with no weaponry? You're not going to go to war barehanded, are you? We're not going to send our men over to fight a war on a cruise ship. Are we? No, they're going over on battleships, on aircraft carriers, on submarines. They're going to make war. They have arsenal. Amen. Ephesians says that we are to put on the full armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6. See, we go to war not once a year. Not once a month, not once a week, but every day. Amen. Amen. You go to war every day. Now, I'm not much for speaking about dreams, but I did have a somewhat poignant dream not too long ago, and it was one that I was enlisted as a soldier. 
<laughs> Imagine that. That was my dream, by the way, when I was a young boy, was to be Special Forces Ranger when I got older. For some, whatever reason that didn't come to pass, <laughs> I became a preacher instead of a soldier. But in this dream, I was a soldier and I, I was enlisted uh, in the army. Well, there was something that was holding my feet and I was unable to go to war as if I was being held back. Now, the scripture says that we are to lay aside the book of Hebrews every sin which so easily besets us. Every weight. Okay? You don't want to go to war having 500 pounds of weight on your back, do you? You're not going to get off the ground. You ain't going to take one step. If you do, you're going to fall over. Amen? You remember the story of David and Goliath. And Saul says, okay, David, I know he's going to be lunch meat for this Goliath, but go ahead and put my armor on him. Can you imagine that? The king taking his armor off and putting it on a teenage boy. What does that tell you about the king? Complete coward, huh? He shouldn't have been the king at all. If you're going to strip your own armor and put it on a, a boy. And David says, uh, he put that armor on. He said, I can't move. You know? Hey, get this off me. You know, I don't, I don't know what this is all about. The scripture says, you don't put your trust in horses or chariots or in the arm of man. You put your trust where? In the Lord. Amen. In God. God is our trust. So David gets the armor off. He said, now I'm ready. Okay? It's just me and you and Jehovah. Now let's see who's going to win the battle. Right? God's just looking for an instrument to work through. Okay, God could have commanded Goliath to drop dead on the spot. Could have stopped his heart from beating. But no, God was interested in little old David, wasn't he? God wanted to display his power through a 12, 13, however old David was at the time, boy. And to defeat this great man of war. Amen? By the hand of a little boy. David, you know the story. All he needed was his little slingshot. And uh, one stone. Now he had five, but he only needed one, didn't he? Amen. And so the story goes, the other four were for Goliath's four brothers. They, they didn't, after they seen what David did to Goliath, they didn't want a piece of old David, did they? <laughs> they, they hit the road. They, oh, that boy can really throw it. We better not mess with him. David says, I come to you not in my own strength, not because I'm a great shot with my sling. I come to you in the name of the Lord. Amen. It was the Lord who guided the stone and sunk it into Goliath's head. Not David. David was merely the instrument by which God worked to defeat the enemy of the children of Israel. And that's the story throughout the pages of Scripture. God is looking for somebody, man or woman, whose heart He can completely control. Amen. Whose heart He can completely control. That means you and I must yield ourselves unto the Lord. When you're driving out on the road, you'll see occasionally a sign that says yield. Right? You're coming up on an exit and you have to yield Amen. to the oncoming traffic. That means you slow down and you take a look. Right? 
You give way to the other traffic that is flowing in the other lane. God commands you and I to give way to His will and not our own. Amen. To give way. That's why our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane, when He was struggling with drinking the cup, which was going to be the wrath of God poured out upon Him, said, Not my will, but thine be done. Now if our Lord Christ had to say that, how much more do you and I need to be saying that every day? Amen. Amen. If our Lord, who had no sin in Him, had to say, Not my will, but thine be done, how much more do we need to be crying out, Not my sinful will, but thy holy will be done. See, Jesus did not have a sinful will. Jesus was without sin, and yet there was a temptation that he had to resist in order to do the will of God, wasn't there? One preacher put it this way. He said, Jesus, as God, was not able to sin, but Jesus, as a man, was able not to sin. You got it? Jesus as God was not able to sin, but Jesus as a man was able not to sin. Right? Okay. So you and I need to learn from our Lord that we too can resist sin, but we can only do it when we turn to the Lord. Now the word here means to run to the Lord. Literally, when it says, in you do I trust, it literally means to throw one down upon his face. Jesus, is said in the Garden of Gethsemane, fell down on his face, didn't he? He wasn't in the nice posture as the pictures show him, uh, kneeling on the rock in the moonlight shining down on him. You all see the picture, right? He looks all pretty and the moonlight and this beautiful night. Uh, what's that? Hate the devil. Who? Hate the devil. Hate the devil? Yeah. I'm not sure, John. Um, but Jesus was on the ground, wasn't he? He was on his face. His face to the ground. It means to lie, throw oneself upon his face, to lie extended on the ground. The righteous are bold as a lion. Now listen, when a lion is about to get his prey, does it stand up and growl and run, you know? No, the lion crouches down, doesn't he? He gets down real low to the ground, and he's just right there on the ground. Why am I telling you this? Well, the Bible says that God lifts up the humble, he gives grace to the humble. You know what it means to be humble? It means to not have an exalted opinion of yourself. Amen. It means to be lowly of mind. It says that Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Amen. It doesn't mean Moses was a weakling. In fact, he wasn't. He killed a man with his two bare hands, didn't he? And he drove off the shepherds and a well of water for his um, soon-to-be wife. And, um, and anyways, he was he was a strong man. But the word meek means to be self-controlled. Amen. It means to be self-controlled. 
And when you and I are controlled by God, the Holy Spirit, then we really are self-controlled, aren't we, Brother Charles? But when we are not being self-controlled by God, the Holy Spirit, we are then being self-controlled by the flesh, aren't we? There's two natures that belong to the Christian. There is the flesh, which is the carnal nature. You and I still have it. It's not, it's not dead yet. It won't be until you take your last breath and lie down to the ground and don't get back up. Amen. It's not death. He's still fighting, isn't he? You know, in one sense, the old man has been crucified. When you got born again, he got crucified with Christ. Positionally. You understand? Positionally. That table is standing there in its position, but it's not necessarily being useful, is it? It's not being put into practice. So in a positional sense, the table is there. It is made, but in a practical sense, it's not being in, put into use until people sit around it and use it. What am I trying to tell you? I'm saying this. Positionally, we have died. The old man has died with Christ on the cross. That's why our sins have been forgiven and omitted, because we have died with the Lord. Amen? There was a new man that rose with the Lord, as 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new man, a new woman. You see? So the old man, although positionally he died with Christ, practically he's still very much alive, isn't he? Positionally, we will not, we are not condemned. We stand justified in the sight of God right here, right now. When God looks at you and I, if indeed we are his children, I hope and believe all of you gathered around me are. He does not, he is not going to condemn you. Not because, God say, now if you committed this certain sin in the future, then I'm going to condemn you. No. Your sins have been placed on the Lord. You will not, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Romans 8, 1. Now, there is a battle that is still taking place between the new man and the old man. And that is the battle of holiness, isn't it? The battle of holiness. God says that we are to be holy even as He is holy. What does it mean to be holy? Well, it means to be set apart. Amen? To be set apart for who? For God. When God said to Moses, take the shoes off of your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground, what was he talking about? Well, Moses' shoes were made by man, weren't they? Amen. God says, remove that which is man-made. I want to deal with you as I created you. Come to me barefoot. Get the carnal things out of your life. When you come to the Lord, you've got to come in spirit and in truth. Amen? The more you cling to the things of this world, the farther you will be from the Lord. God is spirit. God is true. God demands that we come to Him in those two manners. Spirit and truth. God hates deception and deceivers and lying. He says, these are abomination to me. Aren't you glad we can trust in the Word of God? We don't have to doubt God's Word. We know, brother, that God speaks the truth. That God is not going to say something 
that is untrue to us, is he? He gives us this book, nearly 1,200 pages of truth. And every time you and I open it up, you can bank on that being the truth. We can trust in His Word. And that's why you can trust in the Lord. Because His Word is the truth. Now, verse 2 says, let me not be ashamed. Uh, bush is the Hebrew word here for ashamed. And it's a primary root and it's meaning to be pale. That is by implication to be ashamed or disappointed or delayed. He says, oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let me not be confounded or confused. Let me not dry out. Let me not feel shame or disconcertment. You see, when we come to the Lord in trust, God removes the shame, doesn't He? He removes the guilt of our past sins, doesn't He? He says, though your sins be as red as crimson, I will make them white as wool. Though they be red as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. How does a God do that? Well, He did it in the person and finished work of Christ, didn't He? He says, all your sins, as filthy as they are, I'm going to lay them upon my son. And then I'm going to unleash my wrath on him. And he is going to make atonement for your sins. He is going to endure what you and I would have had to endure for all eternity, burning in hell. That's what Christ endured for us. He endured the punishment that you and I would have had to face for all eternity. That's a long time, ain't it, Brother Brian? Eternity? That no end. You think, man, when's this road? You know, I've been out on I-70. You ever been out on I-70 driving to Colorado or something? And you just see your road, you don't see any end. You say, well, I don't see any end to this road. It's just flat, and all you see is the horizon. When's it going to end? Well, for the people in hell, it's not going to end, is it? That's why hell is such a horrible place is it to be. You see, hell is not so much the absence of God, but it is the presence of His wrath, isn't it? You know, God is perfectly just in pouring out His wrath against sin and people in hell. They're getting what they deserve, right? Amen. They are getting justice. When a man goes out and shoots another man, as happened this last weekend, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Man got shot right up there, 22nd and Grove, okay. all over the news. Well... I don't know if they caught the suspect or not, but I can tell you this, that when a man shoots another man unjustly, he just pulled out cold blood, you know, murder, murders a man with that, not in self-defense or anything like that. But when you go out and murder somebody, first degree murder, that's what they call it, you know, you didn't have no business doing that. Well, the judge is going to sentence you, most likely, either to death or life in prison, isn't he? You ain't getting out, are you? No. No, back, now, it used to be more lenient back in the, you know, 80s and stuff. When I was growing up, I remember the guys killing people, they'd get out in 15, 20 years. But they've kind of cracked down on that now, haven't they? You know, we're throwing the key away on you. We don't want you going back out and killing somebody. God 
they're getting to what they deserved. Amen. They deserved it. They know deep down inside if they're going to pull that trigger on somebody unjustly, then they're going to have to do the time, ain't they? Yeah, their life is going to be swallowed up behind bars. Well, that's not my kind of idea of a life to live, is it? No, I don't want to be locked up. I want to be like the bird. I want to be free. Amen? I want to be with the Lord. I want to be in heaven. I don't want to be locked in hell. Do you? For all eternity? No. A wise man turns to the Lord. It says here that uh, in Proverbs 17, verse 2, a servant acting wisely will be over a son causing shame. So this is what the word shame. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. So here it is, enemies. It is an adversary, an enemy, a foe, to hate one on the opposite tribe or party, to be hostile. Now you and I, we have three great enemies, don't we? The world, the flesh, and the devil. Yeah. Now these three are always out to do three things to us. Kill, steal, and destroy. Amen? Amen. You know your old man, your old, your old you is out to destroy you, believe it or not. He say, How does he, why does he want to do that to me? I've been nice to him my whole life. You know, I've given him food. I've given him pleasure. Uh, I've taken him on, on uh, vacations and let him see all the, the uh, dainties of life. <laughs> Why does he want to kill me and destroy me? Because he's an enmity with God. The old you, the carnal you, is at war with God, believe it or not. And this is because of the fall of man. The Bible says, the book of Romans, that we die in Adam. Okay? You and I died spiritually in Adam. You remember when God said, in the day that you eat of the, fr the, the fruit, thou shalt surely what? Come on. Die. Now, did Adam die physically that day? No. He died spiritually, didn't he? That's why it says he ran and hid himself from God. He became afraid of God, didn't he? You know, the wicked of the world, they know God exists. They might call themselves atheists or agnostics or whatever. But deep down inside, they know God is real. But they've chosen to run from him, haven't they? The secular education has chosen to run from God and say, we don't need this. We got science and math and literature and what's that book, the Bible? Well, did you know back in the 1800s, there were only two books in school, the Bible and the hymn book. Two books. That's all you had. That's why people were godly back then. Because that's all they, they read was the Bible in school. Okay? That would make you pretty godly. You go to school, you, that's like being in Bible college from elementary. Amen? The Bible and a hymn book. Well, we need to get back to our roots like that. We, as a nation, have forsaken God, haven't we? We've thrown Him out of the schools, and we're trying to throw Him out of our society. But there are a few candles that are still burning, amen? There are a few uh, lampstands that are still giving off light. There are a few salt shakers 
in the world that are adding flavor to life. We, as children of God, we are the salt and the light of the world. Amen? Why is that? Because we represent Jesus Christ. Now, whatever you have been called to do in life, whether work at a uh, manufacturing facility, doctor's office, school, uh, wherever you may be called to work, you are to represent Jesus Christ wherever you go. Amen? You are the Bible that the world will read. They ain't going to go home and say, oh, it's 2 o'clock, Brother Tom. Time to get BB in on. Let's listen to the Bible. Uh, it's, uh, it's morning time. It's time to get into my morning devotion and, and open up the Word of God. They ain't going to do that. See? They're going to see Christ by your life. They ain't going to come in here and say, how many people you see standing out the door saying, I'm here to, to be in the church service today. Ain't happening, is it? No. They're only going to come if you go get them. If you go tell them the gospel, the good news. You say, look, I know you've been my neighbor for a while and I, I sincerely apologize, but I've always wanted to talk to you about Jesus Christ. He saved me. And, and I would like to tell you a little bit about Him. He can save you too if you're willing to turn to Him. If you're willing to begin reading His Word. If you ask Him for forgiveness of your sins. You too can have eternal life. You too can experience the joy and happiness that comes to God's children. You know, I've been reading a book here lately by a man named John Owen. The man was a great man of God. He wrote prolifically on the Scriptures. This man wrote over 12,000 pages just on the book of Hebrews. Now that's telling you something, ain't it? That's a man after God's Word. Now you don't go writing on 12,000 pages about something you don't care about. <laughs> Amen? Well, I've been reading in one of his books here lately, and he talks about how you and I rightly represent God by doing things that are like God. What do I mean? What I mean is when we are kind and merciful unto others, when we are loving and giving and forgiving, we are showing them a side of God, aren't we? We are showing them an attribute of God. When we give them a gospel track or tell them about the good news which is found in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are acting like the Lord, aren't we? We are giving them, the Lord gave us His Word, did He not? He said, I give you my Word. My Word I give unto you. These words are spirit and they are life. When you give the Word of God, to another person, you are giving them spirit and life. Amen. Follow me. You're giving them what they need in order to become what? Born again. Right? They ain't going to get born again without having the Word of God implemented into their souls. Amen. You've got to hear the Word before you believe. Amen? You've got to know the Gospel. What is the Gospel? The Gospel is Jesus Christ. 
isn't it? It is God becoming a man. Is that not the gospel? That's some good news. It says the heart, the herald angels, right? The angels were, they were proclaiming, glory be unto God. Here's the gospel. The gospel has arrived. Amen. Glory in the highest. For the gospel has arrived. The gospel is not an idea. The gospel is a person. Isn't it? Yes. So what's the gospel? The gospel is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has to come in to your door, doesn't he? Amen. Not just good enough for him to stand at the door and knock. You know, you're seeing these pictures of the Lord standing at the door and knocking. It doesn't have to do with becoming, being born again. That has to do with repenting of your sin. He wrote that in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's writing to the church. Uh -huh. Jesus is knocking on the church's door, saying, Hello, it's time to repent of your evil ways. Amen. When Jesus comes in, he don't knock. Jesus kicks the door down when he comes into your soul. Amen. Boom! Crashes that thing down and he comes in whether you like it or not. Why? Because you've been chosen by God before the foundations of the world. If God chooses you to be a Christian, you're going to bust your door in it. It's just a matter of time before he comes in. Uh, it took me 22 years before he kicked my door in. I'm so glad he did. And that bright, sunny Sunday morning, November 6, 1994, the Lord kicked the door in. Amen. And I got born again. It's been 24 years now. It seemed like it just yesterday. You know, I don't know. <laughs> I just, just the Lord just been so good to me. It seems like it just yesterday. I'm looking at this little book, Bible Promise Book. I looked on the inside cover. That thing was dated 12 8 94. I say, wow, I must have got that a month after I got born again. I went down to the Christian bookstore and I bought that. I say, man, now I remember. Well, when God comes in, things have to change, don't they? Amen. Jesus said to Peter, when you were young, you went about doing your own business. But when you get older, you're going to be led by the hand. Amen? When, when you're young as a Christian, you're still doing your own little silly things, ain't you? You're still following after the lust of the flesh. Pride of life and whatnot. But once you get on that road, you start traveling that road, you see, you, you, you start getting further and further away from the old man, from the day that you got born again. You, 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 you're racking up experience and wisdom. You're going to be led by the hand, ain't you, Brother Tom? The Spirit of God is going to lead you. He's saying, now, you've been doing your own way, Saul, for quite some time. But now I'm going to give you a new name, Paul. You ain't Saul no more. You're Paul. Uh -huh. You follow me? If any man be in Christ, he gets a new name. I'm no longer pagan. I'm no longer heathen. I'm Christian. Amen. Amen. And I'm so glad I am. Ain't you glad you're a Christian? Amen. Christian means Amen. follower of Christ. Amen. That's what the I-A-N means. On the, on the end of Christ, I-A-N means you follow the Lord. I am no longer a heathen. Child of the 
king. Amen. I need to watch my talk. I need to watch my walk. I need to be about my father's business. Amen. Say it again. Listen, folks. Our days are numbered. You are one day closer to the grave today than you was yesterday. You follow me? That sand glass is getting smaller, ain't it? Yeah. The wrinkles ain't going away on our faces, are they? We look in the mirror and say, well, one more wrinkle. Man, they just keep them coming. You know what? Wrinkles are a blessing, ain't they? Because they remind us our days are running out. They're a reminder from God, ain't they? Say, I ain't got as much hair as I used to have. Well, that's God letting you know you need to get busy. Time's running out. Amen? You know, uh, you say, I ain't got the strength that I used to have. No, you don't. Neither do I. We need to get busy about the Lord's work. Amen? And when you do the Lord's work in the Lord's way, then you get blessed. Then you're a blessing, ain't you? But you got to do it in His way. Well, I'm just about through. I know y'all are hungry. Let me just say this in closing about our enemies. The enemies of God are a rebellious people. We are stiff-necked when it comes to the old man, aren't we? We are as the horse and the mule which need to be beat into doing God's will. Y'all heard of a man named Oswald Chambers? Oswald Chambers was a writer and he said this concerning God's will. He said, God's order has to work up a crisis in our lives because we will not heed the gentler way. <laughs> Pretty good, ain't it? God's order has to work up a crisis in our lives because we won't heed the gentler way. God says, come. You say, uh-uh. God says, oh yeah? And he grabs you by the back of the shirt. He says, you're coming now. How's that feel? You say, that don't feel too good, Lord. Okay, I'll put it down. I'll come on my own accord. You see, and God says, that's what I thought. You dropped that thing that ain't good for you, amen. You leave it alone. You, you leave that for the world and the devil. See, you've been crucified with Christ. You have no business meddling with sin anymore, do we? No. God expects us to be holy. Holy, holy, holy uh. unto Him. Without holiness, no man will see God. Amen? And you can see God here and now in holiness, can't you? Amen. Say, well, I don't see Him. You see Him in your heart. You see Him in the hearts of others around you. Amen? Amen. You don't see the air that you breathe, but you know it's there, don't you? Amen. God is real. And God expects us to come to Him in genuine faith and in genuine prayer. Amen? And that's what we're going to do right now. Let us pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Lord, Father and Holy Spirit, we thank you once again for being with us. We thank you for never leaving us, Father, but for protecting us from our three great enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And it is a mystery how we are to cooperate with you, but your word never changes, and your word commands us 
to resist the impulses of the flesh and to draw nigh unto you, to be holy even as you are holy. Father, it is our desire to be holy. And we cannot be holy without you working the spirit of holiness in us. So we pray and entreat you, Father, that you will empower us with your spirit of holiness. But God, that you will cause us to flee and trust in you. To flee to you and completely trust in you. To not give way to the impulses of the flesh. Father, we thank you for choosing us from before the foundations of the world. Placing us in Christ and giving us everlasting life. Thank we thank you, Lord Jesus, for taking all of our sins upon thyself. Not as a license to sin further, but as a license to love you. As a license to obey you. Oh, Father, we thank you for your great love for us. We praise you, Holy Spirit. We worship you. May you have your will to be done in each one of our hearts, lives, and minds throughout this day and for all eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, well that's going to do it for today.